Welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started shortly here. Today's lecture is using the Zoom meeting feature. Um, feel free to turn off your video if you'd prefer to eat lunch in, in peace and, and not on the screen. If you want to just see the speaker, click speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. As a reminder, you're muted, um, but we will eventually want to hear from you. So please send your questions or comments to Will Sedlak uh, through the chat feature. Uh, and we'll compile them for the Q&A at the end. And, and thank you for joining us. But lastly, just wanted to note that, as you may have just heard, this lecture is being recorded and the video will be shared uh, with you uh, and the world later today. Okay, I'm just letting a few people trickle in and then I'll get started uh, here with the program. Give it one more minute. Uh, these things tend to be, going to take it just a few seconds seeing people trickling in. There's still some folks coming in. Okay, we do have a tight program, so I, I, I probably should get going. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Associate Professor of Law, Anthony Maffa from the University of Maine School of Law. Uh, and I'm pleased today to be kicking off uh, this first annual Indian Law and History Lecture, um, which will be jointly delivered by Matthew Fletcher and Sherry Mitchell and moderated by Donna Loring. I'm gonna run through uh, the schedule of events for today uh, and then turn it over uh, to the presenters. So first we'll hear from the Dean of, of my law school, the University of Maine School of Law, Dean Lee Softley, uh, for a brief introduction and uh, a bit more about the, the, the featured presenters of, for today's lecture. Donna Loring will introduce the conversation and then we'll have uh, Professor Fletcher and Attorney Mitchell uh, engaging in uh, each giving a, their own mini lecture and then a, a bit of a back and forth conversation, uh, which will be accompanied by a Q&A. And as I said earlier, if you, if you missed it, send your questions through the chat feature to Will Sedlak and we'll compile them uh, and bring them in at the Q&A stage and then uh, we'll wrap up. So thank you again for joining us and I hope you enjoy the program. Um, and I look forward to future years uh, doing this in person. Good afternoon. As the Dean of the University of Maine School of Law, it's my honor to welcome you to the first annual Indian Law and History Lecture at Maine Law. Perhaps next year we will all be able to gather in person, but for now, this world of webinars has the distinct benefit of bringing to the Maine legal community some of the best minds on the most important justice issues of our time. Today's new lecture series, sponsored by Maine conservation voters, Bernstein Schur and Drummond Woodson, begins the long overdue work of filling an important gap in historical knowledge and awareness in our state. This vital programming connects issues of Indian law to the rich tradition and history of the peoples on whose land we reside. We hope this is another step in connecting the legal community in the state of Maine, the tribes in Maine, and the broader public. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's co-lecturers. Sherry Mitchell is an attorney, author, and executive director of Land Peace Foundation, which is dedicated to the protection of indigenous land and water rights and the preservation of indigenous ways of life. In addition to her work here in Maine as a civil rights educator for the Attorney General's Office and a staff attorney for the Native American unit of Pine Tree Legal, Sherry has worked nationally and internationally in her advocacy for indigenous rights and has received multiple awards for that work. Professor Matthew L.M. Fletcher is the director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center at Michigan State University College of Law. 
Among his many accomplishments, Professor Fletcher sits as the Chief Justice of the Porch Band of Creek Indian Tribe and sits as an appellate judge for many tribal courts. Professor Fletcher has written extensively on Indian law and his scholarship has been cited by the United States Supreme Court as well as many state, federal and tribal courts. We're grateful for his time today. Finally, I'm pleased to introduce Donna Loring who will moderate today's conversation. Donna is an author, broadcaster and former senior advisor on tribal affairs to Governor Janet Mills. Donna has an inspiring background that includes serving in the Women's Army Corps during the Vietnam War, serving as the police chief for the Penobscot Nation, and becoming the first female head of security at Bowdoin College. Today, she directs Seven Eagles Media, a nonprofit she founded to advance the educational, cultural, social, and economic interests of Maine's native people. And she hosts a monthly show entitled Wabanaki Windows on WERU-FM, a Maine-based non-commercial community radio station. Donna, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dean Softly. I appreciate that, that uh, great introduction. I didn't really expect it. Um, okay, so uh, I uh, thank you everyone on the steering committee for uh, asking me to moderate this uh, lecture. Uh, it's a true honor uh, to be the moderator for this first annual Indian History and Law Lecture. So I'll begin. Uh, Maine has created its own Indian law and is not familiar with federal Indian law, it is our hope to provide you with some understanding of federal Indian law, uh, as well as, as Maine law, Maine Indian law. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Normally, federal Indian law applies in these various states and supersedes state law. I think it's very important to look at the history around Indian and federal law. And we'll look at both of these uh, legal perspectives. And I wanna start with the uh, federal Indian law with Professor Matthew Fletcher of Michigan uh, State School of Law. And he'll discuss uh, federal Indian law, its foundations, canons, and other aspects. <clears throat> Professor Fletcher. You're muted. Sorry, my clicker didn't work. Ah, thank you so much for having me. I'm sharing my screen. We're going to show you a couple of uh, comic book pages. So it's uh, a pleasure to be here. It's my job to sort of give you a rundown on the foundational principles of federal Indian law. And those of you, as uh, Donna said, know anything about Maine Indian law, you'll see that a lot of those are inverted in Maine. So let's start with um, some of the foundations what I would call the three foundational principles. By me, I say that this has been sort of an accepted understanding uh, going back to the 1940s when Felix Cohen first published his handbook on federal Indian law from uh, the Department of the Interior. So the first principle is that federal law is supreme. If you read the constitution, you will see that Indian tribes are mentioned as part of uh, right next door to states and foreign nations in the Commerce Clause of the constitution. You'll also note that Article 2 in its original version had a reference to something called, or some people called Indians not taxed. And it's part of the um, proportional representation uh, section of how to vote for members of Congress, uh, who, who counts effectively as people who are American citizens who can vote. Uh, the euphemism, other persons, three-fifths other persons to denote, to denote slaves is also in a similar uh, position in the Constitution. That was struck, of course, in the after the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments. You still have uh, that the, the Indians not taxed language. So even after the 14th Amendment, um, Indian people who are not expressly granted citizenship by Congress or some other agreement 
were considered Indians not taxed, and did not uh, automatically receive birthright citizenship um, or other privileges of American citizenship. Now that all of that is sort of irrelevant now because of a statute in 1924 that extended citizenship to all American Indians. But the relevant point is that um, all of all things Indian affairs related originate in the Constitution, and they are vested with primarily Congress and the federal government. Uh, the second uh, main principle is just effectively the reverse of the first principle, which is that state law is no force in Indian country, because the Constitution effectively preempts state jurisdiction over Indian affairs by vesting Indian affairs in the United States government. Um, that is effectively what. Uh, where, where the second principle comes from. Uh, I would also add that in 1790, the very first Congress within months of its origination passed the first Trade and Intercourse Act, which was a statute, uh, many provisions of which are still in altered form, still part of American law and codified in Title 25 of the US Code. Um, but that statute, those statutes effectively preempted any vestigial state jurisdiction or state authority in Indian affairs. Um, absent an act of Congress, and we'll talk more about this later on, uh, state law, states do not have jurisdiction inside of Indian country. The third principle is often one that is difficult for many people to accept, and in Maine in particular, it's very difficult to, to see on the ground, uh, but tribal sovereignty is inherent. Tri Indian tribes predate the Constitution. They're not um, included in the constitutional polity. They are listed in the Commerce Clause right next, as I said before, to states and foreign nations. So they are definitely sovereigns. What the scope of their sovereignty is, is subject to negotiation and court cases, et cetera, et cetera. But what this means is, um, absent an act of Congress or some sort of uh, divestiture, voluntary divestiture by a tribe, tribal powers remain extant. And so tribes in their own lands, especially on their own lands and especially on their, with their own numbers, um, have significant governmental authority. Let's move on to uh, the next key layer, so to speak, of federal Indian law. Uh, what I've, I've come to call default interpretive rules in Indian law. So the first sort of set of these default rules are typically called the canons of construction. It's an unfortunate thing that they're called canons. I would argue that these are actually constitutional rules of construction. They are not voluntary upon judges no matter what the judges might think. Nonetheless, uh, they're called canons, and so judges typically ignore them anyway, but uh, let's talk about that. Uh, the first three canons have to do with the construction of Indian treaties. So the first key canon, and they're, they're in no particular order here, is that Indian treaties are to be construed as the Indians who negotiated those treaties understood them. So for example, in Michigan in 1855, we negotiated a treaty. The government came with a draft of a treaty, we modified it, we changed it, we renegotiated a bunch of terms. The government went back to Congress with the original treaty as if it had never been changed and got that ratified. That is not the agreement we signed. And if push comes to shove, we can show that the American treaty negotiators engage in an act of fraud effectively and hopefully are able to, if need be, restore some of our, our, our rights as negotiated. Second, Indian, uh, Courts must interpret ambiguities, and you like how I spelled ambiguities, that's a typo. Uh, courts must interpret ambiguities in Indian treaties to the benefit of Indians and Indian tribes. So if there are ambiguities in a statute, in a treaty, or if there is silence, there is a, a vagueness in the treaty, um, and then the, later on there is dispute over the terms of the treaty, those uh, ambiguities must be interpreted to the benefit of tribes. There's a bunch of different reasons for this. One, you can point to the unequal bargaining power that the United States held over many tribes and many treaty negotiations. You can hold, you can point to um, the coercion sometimes and duress that Indian people were under when they were subjected to treaty negotiations. But you can also point to the fact that when the U.S. Um, enters into a treaty with a tribe, it is uh, accepting a duty of protection, what we often call the trust responsibility in relation to those tribes. And as a function of that, the courts and Congress itself will interpret treaties to the benefit of tribes. Third is the courts must construe treaties in the light of history before and after the treaty and in the historical context of the treaty negotiations themselves. 
So for example, there are treaties and or agreements between tribes and the Lakota Sioux and the Dakotas, where the US army surrounded the tribes, threatened to withhold um, food and supplies to tribal members in exchange for a written agreement and consent to a new treaty, consent to different things. Um, that context must be taken into consideration when looking at the context, interpreting treaty in court, the treaty in court. The last canon, so to speak, is canon related to Indian affairs statute. Again, because of the duty of protection, Congress has the power and uh, obligation to enact statutes to benefit Indians and Indian tribes. Um, when they do so, the treaties, or excuse me, the statutes that are ambiguous must be interpreted uh, to the benefit of the tribal party. The next sort of grouping of uh, default interpretive rules are what we call the clear statement rules. And the clear statement rule effectively is in five different areas of law that, um, as a general matter, Congress can restrict, modify, even abrogate some tri tri tribal power or right. Um, so long as, in, in accordance with its plenary power, so long as, when it does so, um, it makes its intent to do so clear. So, for example, um, in Menominee Tribe versus U.S. in 1968, when the when Congress terminated the Menominee Tribe in the 50s, Congress didn't say anything about the tribe's treaty rights. So individual Menominee tribal members still retain the right to hunt and fish on and off the reservation, even though the tribe itself had been terminated. And the court wrote in 1968 that it would not engage in a backhanded overruling or abrogation of an Indian treaty, which is a sacred text. So in that context, there are five areas that we've identified that um, where the courts will apply these clear statement rules. So treaty rights, as I mentioned, in the context of the nominee tribe, inherent powers, where in the case called Ex Party Crow Dog in the 1880s, the Supreme Court said that if Congress was going to abrogate an aspect of tribal powers, such as in that case, the power to prosecute felonies, it had to come right out and say so. And then later on it did, Congress eventually did. Third is uh, sovereign immunity. And then most recently in 2014, the Supreme Court in Michigan versus Bay Mills Indian community reaffirmed that tribal sovereign immunity remains extant unless Congress strips tribes of that of that authority, of that power, and Congress has never stripped tribes of the power of sovereign immunity. Four are reservation boundaries, often closely linked with treaties, because often treaties create reservation boundaries. This case, this um, canon, excuse me, this uh, clear statement rule came into force most recently uh, and famously in 2020 in the case of uh, McGirt versus the state of Oklahoma, where the Supreme Court acknowledging that over a century had passed since anyone thought there were reservation boundaries in Oklahoma, affirmed that in fact, there remain reservation boundaries in Oklahoma because Congress had never explicitly stated or expressed its intent to uh, abrogate the reservation boundaries of the Creek Nation in that case. And finally, tax immunity. Although I will say this, as in the vast majority of instances, the Supreme Court generally rules against Indian tax uh, immunity claims in large part because of political reasons, policy reasons, but um, in theory, a tribe or individual Indian's tax immunity remains extant unless uh, Congress abrogates that immunity. So um, I will conclude and turn it over to Sherry. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, just here to sort of present the general uh, sort of default rules of federal Indian law. And I know that in Maine, this is often subverted. So I think uh, Sherry is your uh, guide to that, to that history of subversion. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me just uh, intervene in here for a second before you hear from Sherry. Um, I want to talk about uh, a little bit on Maine, just a minute or so. Uh, Maine became a state on March 15th, 1820. It recognized the sovereignty of the tribes until the treaty with the Penobscot was signed on August 17th of that same year, just five months after it became a state. It is at this point, over 200 years ago, that the basis for years of litigation began. Immediately after signing the treaty, the tribes were treated 
not as the sovereigns that had power to sign a treaty, but as wards of the state. It was as if they had signed a document of surrender and not a treaty. Maine's relationship with the Wabanaki tribes is unique. And unlike any other tribal state relationship, it is one of constant conflict and litigation. The state insisting on tight control of tribal governments and tribal governments insisting on the recognition of their sovereignty. Maine does not recognize federal Indian law and has not since it signed the 1820 treaty in violation of the 1790 Non-Intercourse Act. Now we'll look at Maine and the effects of the peculiar body of Indian law it has created. Uh, Attorney Sherry Mitchell is a Penobscot Nation tribal member and a graduate of the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers College of Law. And she will speak about Maine Indian law, its issues and effects that it has uh, on the tribes living in Maine. Attorney Mitchell. Thank you, Donna. And uh, thank you, Professor Fletcher. I had the distinct pleasure of uh, having a course with Professor Fletcher when I was um, getting a certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy in addition to my law degree and, um, and actually did some copy editing on the sixth edition of the Federal Indian Law Casebook of which Professor Fletcher was one of the contributing authors. So uh, it's an honor to be able to share this, this space and time uh, with him and with Donna as always. And I would like to thank the um, staff from the uh, Maine Law School, um, Anthony Mafa, and I would like to thank Will Sedlak from the Maine Conservation Voters, um, support being provided to us by Kathleen and of course, Dean Softley's introduction of us. Um, we have such a short period of time to go over these, these concepts that are, that are quite intensive and um, involved. And so I'm gonna do my best to give you a brief synopsis of, of the law um, connected to, to these issues and uh, starting with just providing a, a historical timeline that I think is, um, is important. Um, and one of the things that Donna mentioned was you know, the, the early beginnings. Uh, I had a very specific time frame that I was given today to speak to, but I think it's really important to go back to those early um, interactions and to look at the, the unwillingness of the state of Maine from the very beginning to accept tribal rights, to accept federal law um, in regard to interactions and engagements with Indian nations, and uh, to recognize that there was a building hostility uh, within that relationship that initiated from the moment Maine became a state and continues to this day. Um, and that was demonstrated and has been demonstrated many times throughout our history, including in 1873, when the Maine legislator, legislature amended the constitution to remove um, all language pertaining to their treaty obligations to the tribes to, in the printed copies of the constitution. Um, and so there's a prohibition on printing copies of the Maine Constitution that includes the provisions that outline Maine's obligations to the tribes, uh, the Wabanaki nations, uh, which tells you really all you need to know about how Maine feels about its obligations to the, the rights of Maine Indian nations. Um, here in 1967, um, you know, leading up to, in the time leading up to when the Settlement Act um, was signed, uh, we had all of this tension that, that as I said, had been building um, and continued to be exhibited by the state of Maine, uh, where you know, the passage of the 1924 citizenship bill, um, where American Indian people should have been allowed to vote, um, Maine was, was one of the very last states to comply. Um, and 
and had failed to provide voting places for Native American people here in the state of Maine for anybody within the uh, Wabanaki nations. Uh, and it was only after the federal government applied pressure on the state of Maine and threatened to withhold funds for the completion of Interstate 95 that the state finally uh, gave in and allowed uh, Wabanaki citizens to vote. Uh, then we have, uh, you know, this, this period moving toward um, the Indian Self-Determination Act where uh, there were things that were happening on a federal level where the, uh, you have the Indian Civil Rights Act being passed where it provided certain delineated rights found in the U.S. Bill of Rights to uh, tribal citizens. And then that was amended uh, to require tribal consent to any expansion of state jurisdiction, uh, which is very important. Um, and then the Indian Self-Determination Act um, was passed. And this was on the, on the backside of the Indian termination period where, where there had been this, this uh, concerted effort to terminate uh, tribes. Um, and so the Self-Determination Act um, was a turning point where uh, Indian sovereignty and self-determination rights were starting to be acknowledged and uh, that was being demonstrated by what was going on, these, these particular things that were going on within um, the federal government at that time. And so these, these are all important steps leading up to the time of the Settlement Act. Um, and the Indian Self-Determination Education Act uh, gave tribes autonomy to be able to determine what types of programs were going to be enacted in their communities and how to fund those programs. Uh, so they got to determine uh, where the federal monies that they were receiving were going to be utilized in their own communities so that they could make a determination about the types of communities and community programming that they wanted to have. And then we go to 1975 where um, Passamaquoddy v. Morton was decided. Um, the holding in that um, case, and Donna had mentioned the Non-Intercourse Act, um, the holding in that case was that the Non-Intercourse Act applies to the Passamaquoddy tribe in the Penobscot Nation um, and recognizes the trust relationship, oh, sorry, recognizes the trust relationship between uh, the Wabanaki uh, tribes and the United States government. So it's recognizing that they have a nation to nation relationship, uh, essentially recognizing the sovereign status of the Penobscot Nation and the Passamaquoddy tribes. Uh, and then in 1976, we are officially recognized by the federal government as federally recognized tribes. Um, and then um, we move into the cases that were immediately preceding the Settlement Act, which are, which are very important. So um, in the State v. Dana, the, the, um, the federal court held that uh, criminal laws are not applicable to Indians on Indian lands in Maine. Um, and so, Essentially, what this recognized is that the states had, I mean, the tribes had uh, nation to nation relationships with the federal government as sovereigns. This is a sovereign to sovereign relationship that's being recognized uh, in state v. Dana. Um, and also that, you know, the state of Maine um, did not have the authority to exert their criminal laws on, uh, on Wabanaki citizens. And one of the things that I think is really important here is that um, the, one of the arguments that the state of Maine uh, had in this case, in State v. Dana, um, was that they tried to negate the status of the tribe. They tried to say that the Passamaquoddies no longer existed, um, and, um, and the, the justice in that particular case, Justice Warnock, um, noted the state's attempts um, to negate the tribal status of the Passamaquoddy in um, his opinion in that case and, um, and, and recognize the tribe's unbroken existence and their continued occupancy of their traditional land. So that's also important that the state, you know, here when this case was going on uh, between 1977 and 1979, when it was decided um, that the state of Maine was still actively trying to diminish um, uh, from a legal perspective, the rights of, of the tribes in Maine. And then we have um, in that, right in that same time period, Bottomley versus Passamaquoddy. Um, and that case held that the Maine tribes have the same tribal sovereignty as other federally recognized tribes under federal Indian law. 
And again, it's important to note here that the justice in this case also acknowledged that the state of Maine, who had entered into the case as a, a, um, an amicus, uh, contested more vigorously than the appellant uh, any implication that the court might make that the Passamaquoddies had status as a tribe. So in both of those cases, they were trying to uh, eliminate the acknowledgement of the Passamaquoddy as tribes in order to win those cases. Uh, so from 1820 to 1979, which is the year preceding the signing of the Maine uh, Indian Claim Settlement Act, uh, we see the state of Maine vigorously um, attempting to eliminate and to terminate the status of the tribes uh, that are located here in Wabanaki territory. And, uh, and doing so uh, in, in a way that was so aggressive and so vigorous that the justices in both of those cases felt compelled to acknowledge it in the writing of their opinions. Um, and that gives us an idea of the, the tenor of the relationships between the state and the tribes leading into um, the main Indian Claims Settlement Act. And so when we're, when we're looking at um, these particular cases, I think it's, it's really important that, that we recognize that what happened in, in those years prior to, the, um, prior to the Settlement Act, leading up to the Settlement Act, including these cases that I just mentioned, uh, what happened is that uh, the federal government in deciding these cases recognized that um, the state of Maine for more than 150 years had been erroneously exerting control over and attempting to dominate the tribal nations uh, here in Wabanaki territory um, in violation of the law. And that, that what happened in these cases and in, in some of the federal legislation was um, that there was a recognition of uh, extensive tribal sovereignty and uh, that recognition that our, our sovereignty had never been extinguished. And I think that, you know, as we're having these conversations, it's important for us to recognize what was happening nationally in regard to um, the recognition of tribal sovereign rights. Uh, and also what was happening here in the state of Maine with this really ardent and committed uh, attempts to terminate the tribal status of the Wabanaki nations here um, that are located in so-called Maine. Uh, because then we have an, an understanding of what we are really dealing with um, and the types of behaviors that are, are prevalent uh, as we head into the negotiations for the settlement. Act. And so having this critical foundational understanding that um, essentially settlement acts do not grant powers. This is, this is something that's been uh, erroneously believed um, and uh, has, has been misquoted all the time. Uh, people in this state seem to think that the settlement act gave tribes powers, that it imbued them with some type of authority, which is, which is uh, completely false. Uh, it's it's a, a completely erroneous view of um, the sovereign status of the tribes. Um, the Settlement Act simply delimit, define, recognize the inherent sovereignty um, of the tribes. And so tribes have inherent sovereignty over their affairs. Uh, and as Professor Fletcher said, this sovereignty has never been ceded by the tribe or extinguished by federal action. Um, and therefore it continues to exist. Um, and so then we go to uh, another mythology, which is the mythology of municipality that's found in the language um, of the Settlement Act, where people say that, uh, no, the, the tribes have uh, given up their sovereignty and now they're municipalities. Um, and, and this is something that I think is, is um, kind of at the core of the mis- conceptions um, that uh, people believe in regard to tribal rights here in the state of Maine. Uh, and it's also really the underpinning of the purposeful misinterpretation that has been portrayed by the state through various means um, over the years. And I think that it's important for us to look at that. And so, you know, the evidence for this is really in the record. And there's, um, in the next three slides, I'm going to be referencing 
some materials from uh, an article that was written by Penobscot Nation legal analyst, Mark Chevary, who um, years ago wrote on this for Pine Tree Legal. And uh, that link to that is gonna be um, put in the chat if you wanna take a look at that. It's a much longer document, but it gives a real clear history that I think will be helpful to some people who wanna take some time. And there's also um, a really incredible document that was written by Penobscot historian, Maria Girard. Um, she actually did her thesis on the Settlement Act and there's some incredible background information in that as well for those who are interested in learning in depth about uh, what was happening around that time. <clears throat> so when we look at this, this mythology around municipal powers, um, here are some things that I think are really important. And so when we look at um, uh, the Settlement Act and we start to try to figure out what does this municipal language really mean? Um, I'm trying to move this bar um, because I'm, I'm not computer savvy. Uh, that's blocking my view. And every time I try to move it, it jumps my slides ahead. So I apologize for that. So what does the inclusion of this language um, really mean? What was it intended to do? Um, and so when we look at the inclusion of language regarding municipal, municipal powers, um, it was understood that it was intended to expand tribal authority um, and that it was never meant to be a limitation on tribal authority. And when this language is being read um, as a limitation, it's inconsistent with the legislative history of all of the settlement acts. Um, and it also is uh, clearly um, outlined in the Senate reports around our Settlement Act, um, excuse me, which states that uh, in addition, the, the main implementing act grants to the Passamaquoddy tribe and the Penobscot nation, the state constitutional status of municipalities under Maine law in view of the home rule powers of municipalities in Maine. This also constitutes a significant grant of power to the tribes and there's emphasis added there. Um, these statements support the view that this section was intended to be an additional grant of authority to these tribes rather than a limitation placed on them. And then we have um, a further explanation here of, um, of why that, that, uh, that interpretation is false uh, and that the interpretation regarding the, the language around municipalities um, has to be based on this, this particular parameter of duties, obligations, liabilities, municipalities of a, of a municipality. When acting as a municipality, those things apply. Uh, however, that doesn't limit us to uh, being a municipality. Um, so there are two, two um, really important uh, recognitions that are taking place within this. One is that the tribes have the power of a municipality, which means that they can act as a municipality uh, in regard to conducting their affairs. Um, but the other side of that is that we also have, um, you know, our status as Indian nations possessing all of the sovereign powers named in the Settlement Act, uh, as well as those never expressly ceded or withdrawn. Um, and so in the Senate report, there is uh, an analysis of this very thing, which I think is important for us to pay attention to, and I'm gonna try and pay attention to time here. And we need to acknowledge that the treatment of the Passamaquoddy tribe and the Penobscot nation in the main implementing act is unique. As Donna had stated, as uh, Professor Fletcher had stated, stated, it's an innovative blend of customary state law respecting units of local government, coupled with a recognition of the independent source of tribal authority, that is the inherent authority of a tribe to be self-governing. The nation has the rights, and this is from the Senate report in relation to the Maine uh, Indian Claim Settlement Act. The nation has the rights and powers of a municipality for certain purposes. And then underlined here, it also has those powers of an Indian tribe expressly set forth in the Settlement Acts, as well as those powers not expressly ceded or withdrawn, which is in alignment with the canons. And so when the nation acts in a municipal capacity, it's subject to the limitations and liabilities of any other municipality operating within the state of Maine. Uh, and conversely, when the nation is uh, exercising its sovereign powers, it is uh, free of any such limitations and is free of any state regulation at all. And so there's, there's this dual status uh, and it's an expansion of the tribe's authority, not a limitation, meaning we can, be a sovereign nation. We are a sovereign nation. 
Uh, we are recognized as a sovereign nation or as sovereign nations. Um, and we also have the authority to act as uh, in, in, in the same ways that other municipalities within the state of Maine uh, can act. And when we choose to act as a municipality, um, then we are subject to the same uh, liabilities and regulations as other municipalities in Maine. And so it's not a taking away of sovereignty. It's, it's, a, it's an addition to uh, our sovereign recognition. And this is clearly outlined in all of the legislative history, including the Senate report connected to um, the, the Settlement Act. <clears throat> and so this is, there was an important turning point here uh, following the Settlement Act. So, um, and I, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, a demarcation in time. Uh, because what was happening in relation to tribal sovereignty leading up to the Settlement Act was that the key cases leading up to the Settlement Act, um, certainly Morton and then um, uh, State v. Dana and um, Bottomley versus Passamaquoddy, all of those cases recognized the tribe's sovereignty and uh, sovereign immunity. And then we had the settlement. Um, but also we have to recognize that the state of Maine was fighting to the very end um, and was not a willing and cooperative partner in, this, in, in the settlement agreement. Uh, and anyone that was there at the time, anyone that participated in the, in, in the settlement uh, talks at the time um, will tell you that, that Maine begrudgingly came to the table because they were being forced to do so because they had no choice. Uh, that this was the way that the federal government was moving and um, they were being brought to the table not as a willing participant um, in this process. Uh, and then after the settlement, Maine takes on this attitude that um, now that the Settlement Act has been signed, uh, the tribes have no more sovereignty. Uh, they assume that the signing of the Settlement Act is a relinquishment of the tribe's sovereignty. Um, and, and that is entirely untrue. Um, in fact, what happens when the tribes sign the Settlement Act is that they are exercising their sovereignty um, by entering into this agreement with the state of Maine uh, as a sovereign nation. And so the, the purposeful misinterpretation that follows the Settlement Act is all on the side of the state of Maine and it's really not um, a, a lack of understanding. What it is, is it's a continuation of an attempted diminishment and attempted termination of tribal rights that has been going on since the state of Maine became a state in 1820. And so when you understand the history and you understand how they entered into the agreements, uh, what was happening at the time, how the state was fighting vigorously in the courts to deny tribal status even for the Maine Wabanaki nations, uh, then you start to get a, a more clear picture of why there's still tension. Uh, and there's still tension because there's a continued pattern of taking and attempted diminishment and termination of tribal rights um, and uh, the taking of tribal territories. And so when we look at some of the cases that have followed briefly uh, in the interest of time, um, uh, what we see here is we see uh, cases, and I believe that Professor Fletcher um, referenced uh, Stilfen, this case Stilfen. Um, and and we, we see in that case where the state of Maine um, and the state courts are essentially saying uh, that the tribes no longer have sovereignty, that they need to be treated as municipalities. Uh, and then the federal court saying, no, that's a misinterpretation. Uh, and, uh, and, and it goes back and forth with, with these types of um, decision-making where the state of Maine is asserting that the tribes no longer have uh, their sovereign authority um, and the federal government is, a, is continuing to come back and to say, uh, well, actually, no, that's, that's not true. Um, and, and, it, and these cases reflect those varying positions where the state of Maine is saying one thing, the federal government, which has supremacy under the law, is saying something completely different. And so you see the state of Maine violating federal law over and over and over again as it pertains to um, Wabanaki nations. Uh, and then we come into the modern day where um, we have two notable cases where uh, 
um, the tribe's rights are being challenged by the state of Maine, again, uh, in the Penobscot Nation versus Frey, which is formerly Penobscot Nation v. Mills, uh, where uh, former Attorney General and current Governor Janet Mills um, uh, was engaged in a, in a case with the Penobscot Nation, initiated by the Penobscot Nation because the Attorney General's office uh, had just unilaterally issued a statement saying that the tribes no longer had um, uh, rights to their territorial waters, even though those rights had been delineated in numerous um, main state court cases. They had been uh, outlined clearly in the Bureau of Census reports. Uh, federal government acknowledged the territorial um, waters of the Penobscot Nation, but the state just unilaterally thinks that they can just uh, come in and say, no, the tribes no longer have rights. And then they go into a court process where they're again attempting to terminate the rights of the tribes uh, in alignment with the behaviors that have been going on since 1820. Um, and then we have the state of Maine versus the EPA where the state of Maine is, uh, is fighting the EPA uh, to um, reduce the clean water standards that are required for the Maine um, na tri Wabanaki nations to have clean water to support their subsistence fishing rights. Uh, so the EPA has set a standard for clean water to support uh, healthy fisheries to meet the subsistence fishing rights of the Wabanaki nations. And uh, the state of Maine is, is fighting against uh, the EPA uh, and those cleaner water standards. So they're actually fighting for dirtier water uh, in order to prevent the tribes from having their rights to a healthy uh, subsistence fishery. And so when we, when we start looking at it in that regard, it's easy for us to understand uh, the current state of, um, of tension that exists around the Settlement Act. And so what we have is a, a continuation of a purposeful misinterpretation of the law. Uh, we can't say that this is erroneous uh, any longer. This is a purposeful misinterpretation of the law because uh, you know, the federal law has been very, very clear on this. The canons are very clear on this. Um, there's a very clear um, uh, history and precedent that has been set. And so there, this, is, this can't be viewed any other way other than a purposeful misinterpretation of the law um, for the purpose of uh, continued attempts at dispossessing main tribes of their rights and territories. Um, and, you know, this ongoing legacy of racial discrimination is a blight on the state of Maine. Uh, you know, when we go back to uh, the state of Maine uh, actually amending their constitution to hide, prohibit the printing, they, those, those obligations still exist legally because the state knows that they're required to have these, um, but they're hiding the ball on their constitutional ob uh, obligations to the Maine tribes. Uh, their treaty obligations. Uh, when we go back to the state of Maine, refusing to provide voting places and having to be forced uh, by the federal government, refusing to, to pass on funds for Interstate 95 uh, to provide voting places for Maine tribal citizens. Um, uh, to the modern day where Maine is unilaterally um, taking territory from the Penobscot nation and fighting against clean water in order to prevent uh, any recognition or upholding of Maine's tribal subsistence fisheries. Um, and now I believe that it's up to the citizens of Maine um, to really stand up and to demand that this stop, uh, that this shameful history come to an end and that the Maine tribes uh, finally be put into an equitable position with the state of Maine. And I'm hoping that conversations like this can help us move in that direction. Uh, and so I'm going to um, end my, uh, my presentation there and, and turn it back over to Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Mitchell. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Fletcher. I think that both of those presentations were, uh, had a lot of information uh, in them. And I would like to address one piece, uh, I, have to, I just have to correct this. And that's the uh, Penobscot v. Frey case, a river case. Now, Frey is the present attorney general. 
That's why it's Penobscot v. Frey. Prior to that, it was Penobscot v. Mills. Prior to that, when the case originated, it was Penobscot v. Schneider. So I just want to make that point. So uh, now, Sherry, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> um, uh, Attorney Mitchell and uh, Professor Fletcher, I'm wondering if uh, listening to each other's presentations, if there's something that kind of struck either of you about the other's presentation that uh, you might want to say something about. I mean, I, I'm always struck by the fact that, um, and this is something that Professor Fletcher had um, alluded to, that um, there's this disconnect in the state of Maine, um, that there's um, there's an inversion of the law that exists here. And I would like to hear more about that. Um, and, 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 you know, under, trying to help people to understand that this is really an outlier um, and that it's unusual. So Professor Fletcher, if you would like to expand a little bit on that, I would love to hear a little bit more about your views on that. Well, sure. So, you know, the second foundational principle of Indian law is that state law is no force in Indian country unless Congress authorizes it. So Congress has done that lots of times. So um, primarily it's done it through a statute called Public Law 280, which is a statute that doesn't apply in Maine, but to a bunch of other states, like most notably California and Alaska, where it said that states have the authority to execute or prosecute crime that arises in Indian country. Um, that's a pretty dramatic intervention by Congress of states into Indian country. But in Maine, it's not just that, it's also civil jurisdiction. So in public law 280 states, like California, Alaska, um, the states don't have regulatory or taxation authority in Indian country. What they have, uh, besides criminal jurisdiction, is just that the courts are open in states to hear cases that arise in Indian country. They still have to apply tribal law. Um, but in Maine, it's much more interventionist, and um, it's very unusual. There's a couple of other states, um, arguably Texas or places like that, or Rhode Island, that have pretty dramatic, uh, where Congress, through these settlement acts, has uh, authorized pretty dramatic interventions into Indian country. But um, like I said, they are outliers. And this, there's a reason why that uh, the Constitution strips, stripped states of power over Indian affairs. Um, States uh, once were described by uh, the U.S. Supreme Court itself as the deadliest enemies of Indian tribes. And um, in places like California, it was pretty routine to have massacres throughout the 19th century. Um, and slavery in California of Indian peoples extended well into the 20th century. And that's, there's a significant policy reason and a pragmatic reason to keep states out of Indian country. And um, this is, that's why it's typically considered national affairs. I would also argue, and I'm kind of speculating here, that in the Northeast, when you have these claims that arose in the 60s and 70s, and that eventually were settled by virtue of these settlement agreements, that um, the, the bargaining position of the tribes was just abjectly zero. I mean, they were an incredible poverty, no political power whatsoever, little to no land, and were willing to accept uh, a pretty bad deal, given that the, 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 the opposite choice was much, much worse. And I think they were absolutely exploited. Um, I would also say that they were punished for bringing those claims. Um, the reason that states wanted jurisdiction over Indian country was to keep a vice-like grip on what tribes were doing. And um, all of those things are just sort of a perfect storm for a really, a, a bunch of really bad public policy. Donna, do you have anything to add before I jump back in? <laughs> no, I'm having a great time listening to you guys, so go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> um, you know, the, the interesting thing is that at the time that this document was signed, um, there was incredible pressure being put on um, the main tribes to accept an agreement um, that already was... Um, very favorable to the state of Maine um, because uh, 
Jimmy Carter was leaving office, Ronald Reagan was coming into office, and he had said that he was going to refuse to sign any new Indian Claim Settlement Acts. Um, and so they were putting a lot of pressure on the tribes um, prior to the signing of this, just immediately prior to the signing of this, that if they didn't sign this now, then it was going to um, not happen. Uh, they, they wouldn't get a settlement act. Um, but it's also important to note that those who were involved at the time that this settlement act was signed um, to a person claim that the agreement that they signed, that they agreed to, or the agreement that they agreed to, the last one that they read prior to signing, did not include some of the provisions that were in the copy that was put before them to sign. Uh, that there are provisions in there um, that, that the tribes never agreed to, um, such as the main tribes having to be specifically named in any federal legislation in order to benefit from that federal legislation, that that was something that the ball was hidden on them. Uh, in regard to that. So there, is, there are a lot of things and there have been, subsequently there have been a lot of emails that have come out, a lot of uh, records that have surfaced that have indicated that um, those on the signing on the side of the state of Maine um, were quite thrilled with the ways that they were undermining and um, essentially ripping off the tribes uh, in regard to this agreement. Um, and they were gleeful about it. Uh, and some of those people are still today coming to testify before the legislature trying to prevent any, any forward movement in rectifying the errors um, within the Settlement Act and the misinterpretations that have caused all of these problems for the tribes. So I just wanted to share that little bit of history that's known from, from the ground here um, about that particular issue. Okay. Um, I do want to make one observation of the land claims, and that is the original title was the Maine Indian Land Claims Settlement, and it yes. got turned to claims. Well, what happened was it got the focus turned somehow, got turned off land, and the majority of what was in this claims had to do with uh, crimes and uh, definitions of, of the law in other areas other than land. So that was kind of uh, smoothly, smoothly done and changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever uh, federal jurisdiction in the courts that, that the tribes uh, had at that time was sort of uh, lessened uh, to being under state law. And I, I think that those previous federal cases uh, like the uh, the case that the cases that you had mentioned, uh, Sherry, uh, with Bottomley and that sort of thing, those cases sort of scared the state because they really didn't have control at that time. Right. And they wanted to make sure that uh, that would not happen in the future, and that's why I think this claims ended up being more than just land. Right. Well, I think that that's true, and I think that that's why the state has absolutely refused to acknowledge the federal law. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is really important that we've talked about quite often is the fact that you have decision makers who are looking at this who, one, can't access the full measure of the law because portions of the Constitution are prohibited from being printed. So if you're a, an adjudicator, if you're a decision maker, how are you going to be able to determine what the state's obligations to the tribes are if the state has passed an amendment prohibiting the publishing of those obligations? Um, and then we also have here in the state of Maine, as is, is so in so many places around the country, um, no requirement that anybody entering into the practice of law have to have uh, any, any understanding of federal Indian law. And so this is a, a specialty area of the law where the provisions related to federal Indian tri re recognized tribes um, are different than those of others within the United States that there is, um, there is a unique uh, area of law that pertains to the relationships, the, the unique relationships that the United States government, ha government has with these sovereign nations. And, and most lawmakers don't have any understanding of that. Um, and I would love to have Professor Fletcher weigh in on that piece um, because 
uh, you know, this, this is critically important and adding federal Indian law to the main bar is one way to begin to address that problem. Yeah, I, you know, as a law teacher, it certainly is uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. I, I would say that um, what I try to tell students in, at Michigan State, what we do is we have a orientation week for all the incoming 1Ls and they get a, an injunction of Indian law, whether they like it or not. And the point that I try to, a couple of points I try to make to them are that you're practicing in the United States at a time when, you know, you're going to find tribes doing all over the place. You know, tribes are building the border wall, tribes are doing casinos, tribes are extracting natural resources, tribes are engaged in Indian child welfare matters in state court all over the country. And whether you like it or not, you're going to find yourself at some point in your career looking at an Indian law question, even if you spend your career trying to avoid all of that stuff. And of course, you know, a bunch of incoming 1Ls and law students, generally speaking, don't understand that context. And so a lot of them don't value the import of Indian law. So putting it on the state bar, making it something that is in the rotation of subjects to be tested uh, would definitely be valuable. Um, but just a, a tiny little pushback, there are consequences. You know, when New Mexico put, um, put it on the state bar, um, you know, the law teachers I had there, that, that means a lot of people who are truly hostile to people of color and Indian law people, Indian uh, native students and Indian law in general had to start taking those classes and they, they started turning a little bit raucous. But uh, that's, that's just life. We can deal with that. But um, it, I totally agree that, you know, people just don't understand they're going to be confronted with an Indian law question. In a state like Maine, it's going to happen more often than they think. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I will, I'll just add one more thing and then be quiet. Um, I think that it's already happened as far as the legislative uh, judiciary committee uh, where I sat for nine years. There's no real knowledge of uh, federal law in that committee. And it's taken over a year, maybe two years to even uh, start to understand uh, the implications of federal law uh, on a state level. So um, do you guys have anything else you'd like to say, either one of you? Well, I, I, mean, I, I just want to, to say that my experience with um, the Maine legislature has been, um, you know, we have some incredible allies um, out there who are working very hard towards equity and justice, not just for the main tribes, but for all people um, in our legislature. And I want to really acknowledge that those people exist. Um, and there are also those who um, are choosing to be willfully ignorant. Um, there was one um, legislator who uh, couldn't, couldn't figure out and kept looking at his paper and looking up and looking at his paper and looking up and saying, uh, who the heck is the Wabanaki nation? Like, I, I thought we were only, I thought we only had, you know, Penobscots and Passamaquoddies and like they had, they had no concept of who the tribal people were in the state of Maine. And when you have um, people who are making laws uh, and who are making decisions about laws, uh, who have that degree of a lack of knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, when we were, when we were talking um, to the legislature about um, our tribal court and including provisions within our tribal court that the state has for collecting child support, uh, we wanted to be able to have the same provisions to collect child support from non-Native fathers who have children with tribal or not non-native parents, I shouldn't say fathers. I, that was a big, big uh, misstep there because uh, there are mothers too. Uh, non-native parents who um, have children with, with native people and uh, fail to pay child support if uh, those cases are being held within the tribal child support office um, and are being heard by the tribal court, we need to have a mechanism for collecting from those parents who do not live in in uh, tribal territory. And so, you know, we were before the main legislature to make sure that there was, uh, you know, cross-border 
um, cooperation and that the Maine tribes had access to all of the same mechanisms that the state of Maine had to collect child support. And, um, and one of the legislators continually kept calling the tribal court uh, Maine district court. And it was purposeful. It wasn't a misunderstanding. Uh, that person was just purposely trying to be insulting and pretending that they didn't understand the difference. Uh, and they were corrected at least half a dozen times in the course of one conversation and continued to do it. So when you're dealing with that kind of ignorance um, and you're trying to overcome that kind of racism in something as simple as getting our children provided for, uh, then when it comes to issues that are even more controversial, uh, issues where um, there's you know, a real grant of authority or a recognition of tribal authority, the pushback has been severe. And so that, that also needs to be addressed and there needs to be some kind of accountability um, for those who are purposely uh, behaving in such ways that are so disruptive and are so clearly steeped in racism. Um, and so you know, I don't know how to fix that problem but it certainly needs to be named. Professor Fletcher, you look like you want to say something. No? Not at all. Okay, so I think that uh, we can open things up to uh, questions from the public now. Uh, yep, yeah, we've been monitoring the, the chat, so I'll just parry some at you. Um, and I apologize if we don't get to your question. So the first one I want to send your way, Donna, is what concessions did each side make in uh, the Settlement Act when it was first um, promulgated. Sherry, can you answer that? Um, I can, sorta. It's gonna take me a minute. Uh, Cause you have to remember that uh, I was, uh, you know, still had, dirt, still had dirt on my knees when this was going on. Uh, so, um, so um, essentially um, what the tribe um, gave up were valid claims that they had against um, the state of Maine for illegal land transfers in violation of the Non-Intercourse Act. Um, uh, then claims for breach of their trust responsibilities and mishandling tribal lands and resources. Um, and in return for giving up those claims, these legitimate legal claims that the tribes had, um, they received a payment, um, a sum of money. Um, and that was provided 100% by the federal government. And so the state of Maine really benefited greatly uh, the state of Maine uh, didn't give up a whole heck of a lot uh, in relation to the Settlement Act. Um, and as Professor Fletcher stated, the tribes were expected to give up an incredible amount. Um, they were, they were uh, you know, they were being asked to accept some of the impositions of power that the state had uh, imposed upon them for the last 150 years that the court had, had determined were illegal. Um, and the tribes made some concessions and said, okay, we'll grant certain authorities uh, to the state, but they didn't have to, right? Uh, what did the state give up? I mean, that's the bigger question that still remains to be asked uh, because the state didn't pay for anything. They act like they paid out of pocket for the whole thing. Uh, there, were, there were millions of dollars that the state owed to the tribes that were forgiven in this process. Um, and all of the, all of the claims against uh, land and fraudulent mishandling of their trust responsibility. So the, the true beneficiary of this was the state. Um, the tribes conceded, I think, I think a great deal. If somebody wants to um, jump in, I don't know, Professor uh, Fletcher or Donna and and tell us how, what the state gave up uh, other than uh, illegal control and domination over the tribes, um, then I would love to know what the state personally gave up because it, you know, it didn't own the land. Um, you know, it had illegally been imposing power uh, and it was allowed to maintain some of that illegal power that they had um, been imposing on the tribes by agreement. 
uh, and they never paid a penny. So what did the state give up? I, I don't know. I mean, I know what the tribes gave up, but what did the states give up? I would love to know the answer to that question. Well, let me just say that uh, back when I was in the legislature, I had lunch I went about an, two, one of those two hour lunches with an assistant attorney general, uh, the friend of mine. And uh, one of the first things he said to me was, uh, but you know, why are you guys, why do you keep talking about the land claims? That, that thing's over with, you know, that's a dead issue. Uh, you know, when are you gonna stop trying to get changes to that? And, you know, and I said, well, you know, it's not a dead issue. It's uh, alive. document and it changed. Why should Maine make any changes? We got everything we wanted. You guys got nothing. You know, and, uh, and basically, you know, it's true. It started out as a land claims and it ends up with, uh, you know, criminal and civil and everything else over the tribes. And it also ended up with us buying our own land back. So, you know, but, <laughs> What, what do you, yeah, you're right. I, I wonder if there's a good, a good follow-up here that uh, loops in Professor Fletcher a bit and, and ask the question, you know, what, what concession, does this ar arrangement look different than other set and than other treaties and settlement acts like across the country uh, that have tried to to navigate um, the, a similar similar claims like their land the, Maine is not the only state with land unresolved land claims uh, and certainly not the only state that resolved them some of them were resolved by Congress obviously so I, I just wonder whether there's there's a more national perspective that I uh, you know, might inform this discussion. There is, and I'll talk about it, but I'm not going to ratify what I'm about to say. So let, let's recall what, what happened when the Penobscots and Passamaquoddies brought the land claim. They sued for almost all of the state of Maine. Um, they sued everybody, uh, people they couldn't name, but they were private property owners that they sued. And what I've seen in other states, Minnesota, for example, uh, when Wisconsin Oneidas brought a claim, they went door to door and served every non-Indian, non-member property owner um, within their reservation boundaries. Now, what happened when they did that was a good and a bad thing. It was a bad thing in that they antagonized everybody in the world against them. And to just, you know, sort of like draw, draw a parallel to the Godfather, all the five families rose up against the tribes. But the second part of that was really quite brilliant. They um, they got the title insurance companies and uh, totally up in arms, completely terrified that there would be these, uh, that title was clouded to vast swaths of the state. And nobody really knew in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s what, whether there would be viable land claims, whether that the tribes might actually get some of this land back. And so that fear, the, the title insurance companies, um, private property owners who didn't want to deal with this and wanted their governments to settle all of this is a large part why there were settlement agreements. So it's not like Maine, the state, got anything out of it, but its constituents got a uh, clear title, effectively, which is actually quite valuable. Um, nobody knows exactly what that is, what, what the value of that thing is, but it is incredibly valuable. But that doesn't make Maine entitled to jurisdiction over tribal lands at all. It doesn't make Maine entitled to be paid for, again, for land that they had improperly and illegally acquired a long time ago. So um, none of this is, uh, you know, these things don't make sense. But the politics of the time, is my understanding, is a lot of fear. And, um, you know, that's, that's frankly why the Carter administration was trying to make all these cases go away as quickly as possible to make Congress make those things go away. The Depart US Department of Justice is actually quite notorious for showing up in Congress and saying, if you don't settle these things um, or extend statutes of limitations, 
the U.S. is going to be in the hook for billions upon billions of dollars, and they'll name numbers. And it usually gets the Attorney General of the U.S. in big hot water when they do that. It's kind of hilarious, but um, it gets it gets Congress to act, and that's important too. So, Donna, I'll throw this one to you to direct as as you see fit. So, we've heard some discussion already about. Uh, changing your efforts and others' efforts to change the settlement acts over time. But I wonder if there are any or some one of some of the questions pertain to this to uh, whether or not there are viable legal challenges and what the pathways might be to those legal challenges to challenge the settlement acts. Is there is there, is there a federal government entity that might be able to do that? Could citizens do that? How how would such a claim arise? Um, and Yes, so forth. Professor Fletcher, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I thought I thought a lot about not so much the main settlement ad specifically, but just the general sense that uh, whenever a state um, plays this game where, well, this is Indian country, we don't have anything to do with it, we're not going to deal with you, we're not going to talk to you. Um, you know, this is all between you and Congress. We have that in Michigan for a long time. And, um, you know, Michigan is not a public law 280 state. There's no settlement acts that authorize Michigan to do anything. But what they're doing is they were walling off Indian people. Indian people are still citizens of the state in which they reside. They still have 14th Amendment equal protection rights. And when a state refuses to deal with Indian people, it creates a situation where they're being discriminated against by the state's inaction. And I think that's a very serious problem. I think it's, it, it, somebody should think of a, a cause of action, you know, a litigator. And I, it, it's, it's all there, I think, where if you could show that the state's refusal to deal with a tribe um, in Indian country, for example, to sign a cross deputization agreement or to come to some sort of agreement on taxes or gaming, something that would allow Indian people to um, develop their economies or develop their economic and political infrastructures, um, to deal with the outside, uh, to deal with law enforcement issues, and they creates a situation inside of Indian country that is untenable, where Indian people are, are living on their own reservations, are living in, in terrible conditions, and that's a function of the state's inaction, that should act, absolutely be a considered a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, I, I think there is, if, if you had the right judges, um, I think you would, you know, if you had, if you could, you know, get a judge like Willie Fletcher in the Ninth Circuit who would really give some oomph to that, uh, that kind of legal claim, right? Um, you're in the First Circuit and I'll, be, I'll tell you right now, I know there's a tribe with a case pending in the First Circuit right now, Penobscot just lost that big case, not a good place to be uh, for tribal interests, but if you got the right judge, even if it's just to survive a motion to dismiss, that really helps with um, you know, forcing the state, local governments to the table. That would be my, suggestion. Now the Settlement Act creates untenable circumstances within Indian country. And the state can just point to the Settlement Act and say, well, we can do this because of Indian law, blah, 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 blah. I, I don't think you can let them off the hook that easily. Sherry? I, I, this is a question that, uh, this is a, a lunchtime conversation question that comes up periodically. Um, amongst me and some of my colleagues. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is important um, when we're thinking about the Settlement Act is that, you know, this is essentially a treaty, right? This, this agreement, uh, it has been made by two parties and um, the four corners of that agreement encapsulate the entirety of that agreement. And, my concern has always been the state of Maine unilaterally making changes to what's within the four corners of that document, uh, such as its, its gross uh, overreach in the taking of Penobscot territorial waters. When it was not delineated anywhere in the agreement, uh, it's not been expressly uh, granted, right? Uh, it's never been ceded. Those water rights have never been ceded. Uh, and yet the state of Maine unilaterally says, hey, you know, we can take that. That's like me selling uh, me say, let's just let's just fantasize for a minute and pretend that I have 
uh, you know, my home, but then in addition, I have a beautiful lake house somewhere else. And I make the decision to sell somebody my home uh, and I move to my lake house and uh, I'm enjoying my retirement there. And the person that I sold my home to in a different part of the state shows up at my lake house and say, hey, I own this now. I'm like, what do you mean you own this now? Well, you sold your other house to us. So I'm claiming everything that you have now. Now I'm going to take your lake house. I mean, that would seem absurd to people, but that's exactly what the state of Maine is doing. They're saying, hey, you signed this land claims agreement with us. So now we're going to take your water rights because we think that we own everything that belongs to you. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, unilateral taking and unilateral changes that the, the state of Maine has um, consistently been, been um, responsible for since the Settlement Act um, was signed is, is something that I think that the tribes have, have legal recourse um, against the state for that violation, uh, breach of the, the agreement. Uh, and yet, uh, when, when the courts hear those cases, um, as Professor Fletcher said, here in the state of Maine and in the First Circuit, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with the home of the Phipps Proclamation, where there was a bounty put on the heads of Penobscot people, and that whole shameful history that followed that we have outlined today, uh, and the continuation of behaviors that are now 200 years old. Um, and the, the current citizens of the state of Maine allowing that to continue to happen. And so that's why I say that it's really up to the citizens of the state of Maine to step in and to say no more. Now is the time for the citizens to stop allowing for this type of racist um, behavior to continue to be taken in their names as citizens of the state. So that, that answer is a, is a good segue to what I think May end up being our, our last audience question. And it's kind of a combination of a couple questions, which are along the lines of audience member, you know, I as citizen of Maine, I as lost first year law student, you know, what can I do about this issue um, to support, you know, these communities that are that are trying to establish a, frankly, to, to overturn some of what has been uh, problematic transgressions on sovereignty over years and, and how can, you know, if we're not directly involved, what are the ways that we can, uh, or ways that, that the audience members are asking, what, what could they do uh, to kind of support some of the efforts that you're talking about? You say, Sherry, that, you know, the citizens of Maine should say, we, we should stop doing this and I guess the question is, well, how do they make that statement? Are you asking people to, what, do you, what is it that people can do? Well, I mean, there are all kinds of things that people can do. Certainly they can, uh, you know, lobby their representatives in the legislature. They can, uh, they can take initiatives um, within their own communities to pass um, resolutions within their local governments. I mean, this is how we created movement for um, shifting from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day is that there were a lot of small town local actions that led to statewide change. And so, um, you know, see that kind of movement, I think, where people can have resolutions passed by their town councils, um, they can work with the representatives of the legislature and their senators, uh, you know, in, in their territory. Um, and uh, demand that they come to the table with a good heart and a good mind um, with the negotiations that are currently before them. Uh, and they, you know, follow through on, uh, you know, Donna's work from 20 years ago, which was to make, it, make uh, Wabanaki education um, mandatory in every main school. And there are some that still say, oh, I can't do it. I don't have any money, even though we've provided dozens of free uh, curriculum for K through 12. Um, you know, you can get those at the Abbey. You can get them at the University of Maine. Um, you can find them in the tribes uh, for free. And still, uh, still people are fighting against those things. So those are things that you can start to do is you can start to make sure that the things that are already there are being um, implemented and you can uh, start to make sure that your town is in alignment with and supportive of changes to the 
the status quo racial inequity that's existed here. And if I may just follow up, because uh, there was a piece of this question that I think is more directed at Professor Fletcher, which is thinking even broader about this, how can we how can especially law students are asking, you know, how to supplement their education on these issues when some of these courses aren't being taught at their institution or maybe just the introductory Indian law courses taught, like are there resources out there that uh, Professor Fletcher or, or Attorney Mitchell that you could direct uh, students and others who wanna learn more about these issues too? Well, I mean, the great thing about our profession unless you're in the state of Michigan, is that you have to do continuing legal education. There's, there's Indian law conferences all the time. And the fact that you're here um, is a really good step in that direction. So I, you know, even if you're not, a, you know, you know, don't have the opportunity to take a formal class in law school, um, you know, every year there are multiple huge annual conferences that go deep into the weeds in Indian law. Uh, Federal Bar Association, the Tribal In-House Council Association that we host here at Michigan State are just two. There's multiple FBA conferences. TICA, the Tribal In-House Council Association, has an, a monthly CLE lunch talk. Um, and those that's just the tip of the iceberg and all the stuff that um, you can learn. Um, you know, there's more and more legal uh, podcasts and things like that, that that delve into Indian law. Um, I'll, I'll mention This Land, which, you know, is a good podcast. I would also mention like, you know, podcasts like Strict Scrutiny, which are um, some colleagues of mine at University of Michigan who put together a podcast just on Supreme Court cases. And they, they talk about Indian law because Indian law is in the Supreme Court all the time. And, um, you know, it sort of makes it a little bit more mainstream and gives you a, a greater context for where these Indian law cases fit um, in, in the legal, uh, in the Supreme Court, sort of the elite legal stratosphere. Because they, you, you're, I, we talk a little bit about how it seems like the judges don't know anything about Indian law, but when you get up there, they do. Those judges know exactly what they're doing. You may not know how the, what the impacts are gonna be on Indian people and people living in and around Indian country, but they know exactly what they're doing um, in Indian law. So uh, those are just places to look. I think it's all out there. Yeah, I'd also I... like to add that, you know, Professor Fletcher is a prolific writer and has, uh, you know, Turtle Talk. I would, you know, subscribe to Turtle Talk. You can get information on cutting edge um, Indian law issues. Uh, and uh, if you were to ask Grandma Google about Professor Fletcher, you would find a whole litany of things that you could read. Um, also, my former uh, Indian law professor, Rob Williams, has written some incredible books. A book like A Loaded Weapon uh, is kind of an encapsulation of, of Indian law. Um, and, uh, you know, what something that all law students will be familiar with, which are the nutshell books, there's an in federal Indian law nutshell book. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are all kinds of sources of information out there for those who are interested in learning. Yeah, I just want to add that, uh, it, Sherry, since you brought up the Indian Education Act, uh, the Department of uh, Education, the State Department of Education has a a great uh, website now. Uh, they've been working with uh, Wabanaki educators uh, to put resources in that website, uh, and it's a great uh, it's a great site. It's it's getting has a lot of a uh, lot of good information, um, and uh, I think that there are other uh, tribal attorneys and tribal scholars and whatever who are. Uh, in the process of writing some uh, really uh, great articles and uh, stay tuned for those to come out. So I think we're just about at the time to wrap here. Um, and I just wanted again to thank all of our presenters, uh, including Donna Loring, who did a fantastic job moderating and our, our co-lecturers, uh, Attorney Mitchell and Professor Fletcher, um, you know, virtual round of applause uh, for them. I think it was a fantastic kickoff uh, to this lecture series. 
I hope that you all learned a lot. If you want to support this lecture series going forward, uh, there's a link in the chat.